Good afternoon. Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah. Right. So you can see there's around 20 students. Okay, good. Actually, not good. We need at least 27. So anyway, I'll just go ahead and start. Why these major students are missing? Last class also, I noticed there's very few students over there. Right? Uh, like two third, one third is actually missing. So again, uh, I actually don't care whether you are here or not. As long as you can, as long as if you can uh, <clears throat> do everything and explain and everything, if you can I at least watch the video, that's enough for me. But unfortunately, that's not the regulation. So every week I have to send you attendance. So when you actually come into this, we can actually see your attendance. Um, and we can actually give a poll also in order to find this. Um, but usually I don't give the polls. Anyways, uh, so <clears throat> with this, I can actually see uh, like one third of, sorry, two third of the students are only attending the class. Uh, if you are not actually attending the class, make sure that, uh, uh, no, not that uh, there's no, uh, like there's no regulation saying that uh, the students who are not attending the class will be allowed to sit for the exams or anything. So make sure that everyone sit for the, uh, come for the lectures. Um, same for the other modules. And if you have any other difficulties, like a power cut or some health issues or something, uh, you have to inform. So um, I think uh, if you go to the LMS, there's uh, some folder, some uh, new topic called administration. Under that, uh, there's a link. You can go to that link. You can actually submit your, you can actually put your information and you can say why you were, uh, why were you unable to come to the class, right? So uh, you can use that for automobile modules. You can use that for automobile uh, courses. Okay, so today our class uh, main concern is transfer case and Excel section. So it's not actually a long class compared with the other class. This will be very short. Uh, yeah, so we have one session only for this module with this, this is like the uh, second to last. So there, that means we only have one more uh, discussion to be done. After that, there's no discussion. Uh, after that, you just have to start the practical. Well, uh, for that, let's see. Let's see what's gonna happen. Right, so based on the situation in the country and everything, we can decide what to do. So yeah, so in the automotive dry train, uh, we'll be discussing about the transfer case differential and the assemble, and disassemble and the axles. Okay, so as usual, safety first. Uh, before we go ahead and start, I have a few questions. Uh, let me check the attendance. Yes. Um, hey, good. Can you tell me what is the purpose of the transfer case? Uh, so, uh, front engine uh, cars uh, need to uh, transfer the power to a rear engine wheel. Uh, so, uh, transfer case used. No, that's wrong. Anyone else? Kumara? Reduce the component. Sorry? Reduce the component. Reduce the component means? Propellant sound. I'm, I can't hear you. Can you speak a little bit louder? Kumara? So the image, if I just explain what is the, these two images are, so it says AWD and 4WD or 4x4, right? There are two acres, uh, 
uh, the right side one or the black color SUV. It's actually known as Jeep Wrangler. So it actually has a four wheel drive train. Uh, but in the right side one, which is a Subaru Impreza WRX STI, uh, it actually has an all wheel drive system. So what's the difference between these two? Anyone else, Kumara? Yes, Kumara. What is a transfer case? Cartian thirty nine. What is the purpose of transfer case? Okay, Mintushan, Mintushan. Yes, it's drive uh, train four, four wheel drive. All wheel drive. Okay, let me just, yeah, transfer case is used for four wheel drive vehicles. Four wheel drive means uh, it transmit its drive train power. The engine power will be transmitted to front wheel as well as rear wheels. So that's why the uh, front and rear. Uh, so sorry, that's why the four wheel drive is there. So what is the difference between the four wheel drive and all wheel drive? So basically in the four wheel drive and all wheel drive, if you consider the power output wise, both, in both cases, the power is actually transmitted to the front and rear wheels. So all four wheels are actually getting the trans uh, power. But there are two types called all wheel drive and four wheel drive. What's the difference between these two? If you can't answer, at least uh, answer through the chat. I'm going to ask now. Um, Siam 90. Siam, what's the difference between four wheel and all wheel drive? So Sia, where did you find this answer? So Siam sent me an answer. All wheel drive system uses a center differential to distribute the engine stroke between the two engines, uh, between the engines, sorry, between the two axles, four wheel drive, while four wheel drive vehicles relies on transfer gears, which function, uh, which functions like a locked differential. Okay, so yeah, I will accept the answer. But now you have to turn on your mic and uh, just tell me what is a uh, locked differential. Sorry, sir. Uh, I get the answer from internet. Yeah, I know that. So what is a locked differential? <laughs> Mm. Sorry, sir. Okay, these things you actually learned in your last semester. I think uh, Samsung covered these sections. Anyway, so purpose of the transfer case is to transfer the power to all four wheels. But there are two different types of vehicles called all wheel drive and four wheel drive. The difference between all wheel drive and four wheel drive is uh, in the all wheel drive uh, system. It's also a four-wheel drive system, but in the all-wheel drive system, uh, the driver or the operator does not have any control over which, which axle is actually getting power at which point. So in the four-wheel drive vehicle, you actually can switch on and switch off the 
uh, four wheel drive. So at most of the time, the four wheel drive vehicles are actually running as rear wheel drive vehicles or a front wheel drive vehicle, but in actually rear wheel drive vehicles, right? But uh, once you meet only, you just have to engage the four wheel drive system. Uh, but in the all wheel drive system, you does not have that luxury. So vehicle decide when to use the or how much of power has to be sent to front and rear. In the four wheel drive system, the torque, if you get uh, uh, hundred percent, uh, if you get hundred percent, hundred amount of torques, that all hundred will be divided into 50-50 oh, and submit, uh, send to 50% into the front and 50% into the rear uh, in the four wheel drive system. But in the all wheel drive system, it's not like that. Based thing on the location where the power is actually needed, at that time, more power will be actually sent in uh, either front or rear axis. So because of that reason, these all wheel drive systems are very efficient. So that's why even some cars actually have it. For example, the very, uh, so the Subaru WX, the Subaru Impreza WX, WRX STI and Lancer Evolution both actually have this all, drive, all wheel drive system. And they are more advanced than this, more electronic systems uh, actually control the whole system, which you will be learning later. Uh, in addition to that, uh, vehicles like, I know you have uh, these uh, Lamborghinis, Lamborghinis, Porsche, uh, Lamborghinis and Porsches, which are actually comes under the supercar category, which is like very high performance car. They also actually use all wheel drive system. This all wheel drive system can be actually uh, uh, updated and can be actually uh, electronically controlled. Once it electronically controlled, uh, this whole system can even add something called a torque vectoring. So torque vectoring means, uh, just to give a brief idea. So uh, imagine you have four wheels. Uh, so uh, in case if you are actually turning a wheel, turning and you are going to turn and uh, you are trying to push it to the left side of, uh, you are taking a left side turn. At the left side turning, in the torque vectoring, you can actually decide in order to keep, or in order to drive more, or drive the vehicle well, uh, you can actually send more power or more rotational torque into the uh, outside wheel of the uh, that particular corner, uh, making it to turn and uh, the vehicle to move faster. So these sort of things can be actually done with the all wheel drive system. Most of these electric vehicles, most of these electric vehicles such as the Tesla Model S, they are actually all wheel drive uh, vehicles, which even have more advantages uh, systems incorporated into this. So if we move to the next uh, slide. So this is actually showing up uh, this the image on the top. Wait, let me take the spotlight, yes. So image on the top is actually a, a, a showing you a four wheel drive system. So as you can see here, you have the uh, gearbox over here. At the end of the gearbox, near the, as the extension housing, you actually have this transfer case. So transfer case is actually bolted to the extension housing. So this transfer case, uh, has two shafts going front and rear. So yellow uh, pipe, uh, yellow shaft is going front and the uh, blue shaft is going back of the, uh, or the rear wheels. So, so what it actually happens is in this case, the vehicle, uh, when the power is actually coming through, once you engage the four wheel, once you engage the four wheel, at that time only, uh, the power will be actually transferred to the rear front wheels as well. At the uh, all the other times, if it is uh, not engaged to the front wheels, right? Uh, if it is not engaged as a four wheel drive vehicle, at that time only engine is only driving rear wheels. The advantage of the uh, this system is uh, you can actually turn on and turn off the four wheel and rear wheel drive. So turn on and turn off front and rear wheel drive. So things based uh, and it actually helps to reduce the fuel consumption and actually it actually increase the speed as well. So uh, this system is used 
earlier, like long time ago, this was introduced in 1940s, 1930s, 40s, something like that, with the uh, introduction of, uh, you know, this Willis Jeep. Uh, in World War II, actually, this came to the commercial use. So after the advantages were identified, these were actually uh, available for uh, mass market as the Jeep. Uh, then uh, if you have seen the footage, the footage that where people went to the uh, moon, at that case also, uh, they actually used a four wheel buggy in order to travel in the, on the surface of the moon. Uh, the advantage being is since you are transmitting power to four wheels, right? You are transmitting to power to four wheels. You actually have the twice the traction. Since you have twice the contact patch in this case, uh, you can put twice the traction on the ground, right? Twice traction on the ground, making it easier and making it to pull even or even to go even uh, harder terrains like off-road. So in such cases as off-road, this uh, system is very, very useful. So uh, coming back to this four wheel drive and all wheel drive system, the difference between the four wheel drive and all wheel drive system actually comes over here. Uh, over here means, um, over here, right? So in the four wheel drive system, you actually have something called a transfer. In the all-wheel drive system, you actually have something called a differential. So instead of having a transfer case like this, where you can actually select and transmit 50% of the power to the uh, uh, front wheel, uh, instead of doing that, you can actually uh, have something called a differential, where you usually have seen the differential, you fix a differential here, right? So differential is actually sending power to the old front and rear wheels at all times. Right? It transfers power to the front and rear wheels all the time. Uh, when we discuss about the uh, differential, we will understand some things that differentials have some advantage. So uh, differential actually allow you to rotate the wheels at two different speeds, right? Uh, the, the differential you use in the rear, it's actually allow you to uh, rot, uh, allow you to drive the vehicle at three different speeds. So, uh, sorry, uh, wheels at two different speeds. So the same scenario is applied here, right? Same scenario is applied here. Uh, engine is actually trying to send more power into, if it is a fully mechanical, no uh, mechanical uh, beachcraft or anything, if it is just a normal open differential, we usually call them as open differential. In such case, engine will be actually sending the power to both wheels uh, and it will always send power to the wheel it needed the most. So. This system is actually available, uh, started using, all-wheel drive system we started using uh, in 1930s, sorry, 1990s, something like that. The disadvantage of this uh, differential system is you can't actually use an open differential as the center deep. So this, uh, the differential we use instead of the uh, transfer case, we call it as a center diff. We can't actually use a normal open, open differential, which I will explain later what is the open differential. So uh, the, the reason being, if you use an op open, uh, uh, open differential, what actually happens is 100% of the power will be actually transferred to the uh, least resistant part. It always you use the least resistant part. Um, uh, to avoid that, it has to have something called a limited slip differential. In any case, it will actually transfer the uh, power to the other wheel B. <laughs> one not with the least uh, not with the least resistant part with the most resistant part let me uh, but we'll discuss about this transfer case first so inside the transfer case there are two things uh, first one is it can actually engage and well basically transfer case is uh, another gearbox right it's another gearbox so where uh, So what happened is actually the power. So power is actually comes and uh, the power actually comes into the transfer case. From transfer case, it's actually transmitted to the front wheel. So 
once you engage it, it will actually send power to the front case as well. In addition to that, uh, transfer case has another trick or another advantage. It can actually gear it down, right? Gear it down means it can actually give you a torque upgrade, right? It can actually provide you a torque output, a torque increase. How it does that is uh, similar to your first gear. It actually has another gear set in between. So uh, it will actually increase the gearing ratio. So that will actually increase the mm, uh, that will actually increase the so these uh, with all of these things these uh, transfer cases are these are very useful and now it has been uh, developed into another oh, ad, uh, advanced models where you don't actually have to shift the gears by hand right six the gears by hand instead of it uses the same technology or the same uh, components used in the auto gearbox and it can automatically change the gears. Uh, so, yeah. So, uh, transfer case, uh, now the transfer case shown here, right, transfer case shown So the transfer case actually shown here is uh, somewhat different from the one you actually seen uh, previously, because as you can see over here, it actually has a chain drive. It actually has a chain drive. Uh, as I told you earlier, it's actually nowadays a mix of a normal or the manual gearbox and the auto gearbox. So uh, similar to the manual gearbox, you actually have the fork and the selector forks and if, uh, the uh, selector rod actually moving. In addition to that, you actually have something like this. This is actually the same set of gears frame, uh, planter gear frame that you can actually see in a normal uh, automatic gearbox. The advantage of me using this sort of gearbox is uh, you can actually get more ratios with even smaller package, right? And you can see over here, it's actually direct driven. It's actually direct driven. So even though it's actually direct driven, the this will it will not actually transmit in the wrong direction because uh, the gearing is actually done uh, separate, right? So uh, disassembling and assembling section of the transfer case and how transfer case works also we have to actually discuss. So uh, since we actually since I don't have anything over here, uh, what I uh, Prepare these um, these three videos over here, where you can actually go through and learn a lot of things, a lot of more things about the transfer case and disassembling and assembling properly explained for a very modern engine uh, gearbox. Uh, sorry, transfer case assembly, and I hope you will actually go through this uh, before you come to do the, your practicals. Um, so. After the answer case, we actually have to discuss about the differential uh, first question. Uh, so uh, you can see some photos. Before I go into the photos, let me ask you something. I know you know why we have uh, differentials, right? Uh, but how does it work? Can anyone tell me how does a differential work? Purposes of driving condition. Sorry. Purpose of driving condition. No, I mean how it works. So the purpose of it so, is it allow two wheels to rotate at differential speeds. So it allow a vehicle to travel on something like a cone or something like this, right? Where you consider this distance. And the distance up to this track, right? So the this track is actually a larger one. So the the distance we'll actually have to travel is higher. So how does it actually uh, 
copy that. That's what I'm asking. Oh, at least just what type of uh, differentials are available at the moment. So uh, you have seen a differential. I know you did the disassembling and assembling of a differential already. So uh, what sort of differential types are actually available? Lock differential. Sorry? Lock, lock differential. Yes, lock differential. Okay, what is the lock differential? Call it locking differentials. What is a locking differential? Uh, one will lock, another will independent. Okay. Uh, what else? Open differential. Open, open differential. What is the open differential? So yeah, uh, what you actually explained is open and differential. So one wheel is always locked with the drive turn or with the pinion wheel, right? Other wheel is open. That's called the open differential. Lock differential means both wheels will be actually locked as in a common shaft. Right, common axis or common sharp. So there's no uh, differential speed between the two axes. That's actually called as a uh, locking differential. So uh, if I uh, move your uh, interest towards these two images, you can actually see the one over there on the top and the one on the bottom, both of these can actually perform or actually can overcome these obstacles. So the Top one we actually called as a rock rolling, uh, which is a sport as well as motor sport as well as a uh, hobby, right? And the bottom one is actually known as drifting. Again, uh, um, motor sport as well as a hobby, and both are very expensive things to uh, do as hobbies. Anyways, the in order to do these two, uh, in order to overcome these two situations, the vehicles actually have. Uh, vehicles actually differential of the vehicle actually helps a lot so in the first image it's actually called rock crawling in the rock crawling um, you need to actually have something called lock-in differential in, in addition to the huge suspension trouble uh, with you know, floating axles that you can actually see over there you need to have locking differential because uh, in the open differential what actually happens is if you can see in this image uh, so let me try to explain what is an open differential in here. So if you consider here now the contact patch of this wheel, right? The wheel on the left is better. Assume that the contact patch over here is less because I can't actually see, but let's assume that's less, right? This is, that's why I'm putting a small. So this force is capital R, this is simple R. Okay, so if it is a open differential, the power transmit up to the axle, sorry, up to the differential, but the open differential does, it always, it always take the least resistant uh, part, least resistant part. So least resistant path in this case is this way into your right. The reason being less uh, resistant or less resultant force on the wheel, which actually in turns provide less uh, resistive force for the wheel to move. So wheel started to spin without any reason. So that's what actually happens once a vehicle, if you consider a vehicle, if you have seen a vehicle, once it actually stuck on uh, one wheel stuck on mud or something, you can see one wheel started to uh, spin without any reason while the other wheel not spin. The reason is the same thing. The, where the wheel actually in the mud, they, again, because of the surface is very loose, it does not actually have enough pressure resultant force 
So ONG actually sent most um, uh, most of the power back to the wheel. Actually, that's free. So in this case, also same thing happened. So simple R is low, so less uh, resultant force, and uh, so more power is going that way. So less resultant force means the contact patch or the contact between the surface and the wheel is actually less. Contact between the wheel and the road is less. So uh, what happens is even if the engine have thousand horsepower with three thousand uh, newton meters of torque, nothing will happen because you can't actually put the power to the ground. As long as four wheels are in contact with the ground, no issues for the vehicle. So at this point, this wheel will start to rotate, uh, but it won't move the vehicle. But if you have a lock-in differential, where this uh, acts. Uh, Right. This axle acts as a uh, locked or acts as a single shaft, right? Even though these actually have two shafts, if it is acting as two a single shaft, power will be actually transmitted to both direction or the both wheels, both opposite wheels, same amount. So at this moment, you can see this wheel is actually with the good. Uh, contact patch it's actually getting enough uh, torque right or the power in this case and it can actually push towards slowly when it is actually pushing towards this wheel also started to grip with the ground right with the ground and uh, it will started to push to it now uh, this is just to give you a demonstration right it's not exactly how it works in a rock rolling for example in the rock rolling if you can see these tires right if you can see these tires in the sideboard also, it, they actually have uh, some thread. Uh, different thread pattern is even available in the sideboard because sideboard is also used in situations like this. A similar uh, incident is actually happening here on the bottom where in the drifting situation, uh, but uh, because of the high speed power transfer from left to right, it could actually lose the grip on one wheel. Once it actually loses the grip on one wheel, if the vehicle is not transmitting power to that particular wheel, uh, then uh, one the other opposite wheel started to actually get more power, which is resulting vehicle to actually spin out or even losing the whole control of the vehicle. So because of that, having a differential that certain way locked right certain way locked now here there's two differences here in this case as you can see over here it's actually traveling on a loose surface right these rocks and everything is actually loose so the contact surface is not actually uh, adhering or uh, comparing to the tarmac the drifting car is actually running uh, these two have two different surfaces because of these two difference in the surfaces it's not advisable to use. It's not advisable, right? It's not impossible. It's not advisable to use a common locking differential in this case, right? Common different locking differential in this case. But uh, instead of with that, there are some other uh, method you can actually use. We call them as limited slip differential, which allow a limited slip. It's only allow the vehicles to uh, differentiate between a very small range. Beyond that, it's actually act as a uh, locked differential, right? Lock differential. So the physics of the lock differential is uh, somewhat complicated to explain at this moment. Uh, but luckily, you actually have a, a module called drivetrain where you will be actually learning how this thing actually works in mathematics. Okay, uh, so. Yeah, so the differential, I know you have seen the differential, how it is and um, this and that, what are the components and everything. So here again, I'm talking about what is the limited slip differential, why the limited slip differentials are also known as locked differentials are available. So in order to explain the working, inner working of the locked differential and the limited slip differential, I actually put a link below. You can actually go ahead and watch that video and uh, gather more information about how it actually works in the lower uh, in the limited slip differential if i give you a brief introduction it actually have uh, some 
uh, flush plates, right? And it actually allow this uh, shaft to move in and out very small amount. So similar to normal uh, locking mechanism. So once the wheel is actually locked in place or once the wheel is actually loaded, if it have more power, it will actually lock the whole system and uh, keep uh, powering both sides. That's how this actually, uh, basically how it works. So, uh, but uh, it's quite difficult to explain in this state, but I think this video will be actually more helpful with each, with adding, uh, animating the whole system work. So, uh, I know you have already done the differential disassembling and assembling, but I also know you didn't do it properly. Right? I know you do it, will do it properly yeah. because I actually <laughs> designed the syllabus for that module. And uh, so the practical is just to explain or just to explore what is inside the differential. That's it. So in the differential, there's something called um, um, two different adjustments are there. Right, two different adjustments are there. If you move back, right, if you move back, uh, we have these components. So you have the universal joint from the universal joint, power is transmitted to the ring gear through something called the pinion gear, right? Pinion gear, right? Then you have the side axle shaft and the differential gears over here. So side axle shaft here is here, right? These side axle. So the power from the pinion actually goes to the ring gear where ring gear is locked into one side of the axle, uh, one axle and this differential house, right? So what actually happens is you need to make sure, we need to actually make sure these gears are in turn back very well. In addition to that, we actually have to make sure that pinion is not moving back and forth. Right, back and forth. Once these start to move, or once these uh, uh, axle shaft are not properly in contact, because these are actually bevel gears. These are actually bevel gears, not uh, not like a normal gearbox. In the gearbox, everything is machined properly. Once you fix it, it's always going to uh, in contact well as long as all the components are correct. But here, there's so many, uh, there's few adjustments available in order to make sure that everything is in contact properly. So the adjustments, if we first move to the adjustments, we actually have something called the pinion wheel adjustment and we actually have the axle side wheel adjustment. So yeah, so pinion wheel adjustment is what we do is we actually adjust the preload. So we actually have something called a spacer, right? Between the pinion and the uh, yoke or where the your universal joint is actually joining between these two we actually have something a space in between there's a space this is where the housing is actually let me just draw the house um, so your housing is differential housing is going like that right so inside of this housing you have this collapsible space or spacer. Just assume this is a spacer. So you have this spacer. This spacer actually keeps the pinion uh, without letting it to move back or forth. So this spacer is very important component to make sure that wheel, this wheel is in properly fit, right? Properly fit with the um, ring gear, right? Properly in contact with the ring gear. So in order to do so, what it actually use is, uh, it's actually have uh, this collapsible space. Uh, okay, I'll clear that out. So this section over here, right? This is a collapsible space uh, or a uh, shims. We usually use shims or a collapsible space. So uh, even though we have collapsible spacer, some people think that we can actually collapsible spacer or crush, uh, crushing spacer, we also call as crushing spacer. Some people actually think that we can actually uh, hammer it and uh, increase the length and all, but it's not possible. Don't ever do that. If you have any problem with this, uh, use a new one. So once you fix it, the contact between the 
gear wheel right between this uh, bevel gear and the ring gear should be somewhat similar to this it actually should uh, it should actually draw a line like this it's not exactly like that in this case but it should actually um, create a contact patch like this in order to check this contact we actually had some paint on the ring, ring gear and uh, after fixing we rotated it few times in order to fix that in order to check whether it's properly in contact so in order to do so we have something called a preload adjustment right preload adjustment preload adjustment is actually done over here once everything is actually fixed you actually have a bolt and the yoke is fixed or the pinion flange is actually fixed and once you bolt it uh, this whole section comes and rest on the bearing over here so this bearing actually bearing uh, preload adjustment is how we actually measure uh, whether this is properly fixed or not right so we actually have to have the pinion wheel adjustment and the side wheel adjustment in the side wheel adjustment also we actually have to check the contact properly right so these contact in the side wheel we only have to consider about the contact over here in the pre pinion wheel adjustment we actually have to make sure about the uh, pre uh, preload adjustment as well as the contact if you can't take both of these things properly uh, what actually happens is it started to create something like a knocking right knocking so uh, one thing is knocking other one is uh, humming noise so to avoid these things, uh, we uh, uh, we actually uh, adjust two things. We actually adjust two things. Uh, let me just go ahead. Uh, two two adjustments we are actually doing. These two adjustments we'll go ahead and I'll go ahead and explain. Next slide. Two things we will be adjust is the bearing preload and the gear backlash, right? So preload adjustment is as I told you earlier how well the force, actual force, is actually uh, applied on the bearing. So once it's properly applied, only you can actually uh, and you can actually feel the bearing is in tension, right? So it will avoid it moving back and forth. And the gear backlash is uh, once uh, the gears are in contact, there's a small play, right? This play, uh, that, that play should be there, right? But it should not be more or it should not be less, right? It should not be more or it not should be less. So, uh, uh, so it's actually, we can actually test it. This uh, usual dial gauge, dial gauge is actually used to check in. Uh, during the assemble process, you actually have to check it. The preload is also the same case. Preload is actually checked using this particular tool. It's one somewhat similar to uh, a torque wrench. Somewhat similar to so torque wrench. Once you apply the force, right? Once you apply the force, there is a, a amount of torque that you actually have to apply in order to make this rotate, right? Until you reach that torque point torque value this will not actually rotate right so that amount of torque or amount of torque value you actually have to put it rotate is actually known as the preload right that's what we actually known as the preload that amount of torque we actually have to put in order to rotate this actually we can measure it from here so it's more or like a torque meter okay so here what we do is we actually um, fix over the gears and rotate a little bit and check how much is the backlash in this case. So uh, for different gears, gear sets, the backlash is actually set by the manufacturer itself. So this uh, play actually helps them to lubricate very well. So having the play is important. And in addition to that, um, uh, in addition to that, the play allow it to work without creating unnecessary noises right so that small noise will be there but you might have actually feel it uh, some vehicles you can actually feel the jerking effect coming when it's try trying to pick up faster 
So that's actually comes uh, uh, because of wrong backlash, right? Wrong backlash. So setting up these two uh, values properly is very important. So that's why I actually included these two uh, videos for you guys to look. Unfortunately, at our practical, usually we don't have time to do these two uh, practicals. We actually go through the engine and gearbox. We usually don't have enough time to cover these practicals. So what I suggest is you guys go ahead and please watch these videos. Uh, this will actually properly explain how to assemble and disassemble and uh, check backlash. But unfortunately, these videos actually have uh, imperial um, imperial units, but no worries. Uh, you just only have to consider for our case, so we only have to consider about the SI unit. Other than that, there are no difference between these two. Okay, um, that's it, I think. Uh, yeah, that's all about the differential when we move into the axle. So axle practical also, we actually don't do them because the axles I know you already done in your automobile, uh, foundation in automobile practical. So, here you will be usually go ahead, you will be usually go through uh, uh, axle. So there are two types of axles available basically, right? Two types, one is dead axle, the other one is live axle. So we usually call them dead or live based on whether the axle is actually getting the engine power. If the engine power is transmitted to that axle, then we call it as a live axle. If it is not, we call them as dead axles. So, for example, uh, if you take a truck, if you take a truck or a bus, the rear wheel where the engine power is actually transmitted, we call it as a uh, live axle, where the front and uh, while the front axle, since it is not getting any power, it's actually called as a dead axle. So, in order, in addition to being dead or live, right? Uh, these actual suspension uh, axles also have to cope up with the suspension. So there are different types of Uh, different types of suspension. So uh, in the dependent suspension, so you have independent suspension and dependent suspension. So in the dependent suspension, uh, you have live axle, which is the, uh, this is the dependent suspension live axle assembly, right? This one over here. This is the dependent suspension live axle. In the dependent suspension, um, dead axle is somewhat like this. Yeah, you don't have power and it does not. Basically, it actually have a rigid housing connecting uh, opposite wheels. So that's how you actually know with the dependent or independent. Once we go to the independent suspension, you actually don't have a direct uh, connection. There's no rigid uh, connection between uh, left and right wheels. So as you can see on the top image and the bottom image, it's not directly in connected with each other. So they, uh, in the, if you go to the front video image, you can actually see a, a final drive assembly, which is also known as the differential housing, right? So differential housing is there, but differential housing is fixed into one single point in the uh, vehicle undercarriage or a chassis, right? Undercarriage or chassis from the bolts over there. Uh, let me show you the location. So if you can see over here, there's two locations and over somewhere over here, also it will be actually fixed, right? It will be fixed to the uh, vehicle's undercarriage or in, the, in this case chassis. While suspension points, these two suspension points or the uh, shock mounts, right? we also call them as shock mounts, will be also mounted to the top of the uh, to the um, chassis and the lower control arms will actually have a connection between the uh, the these uh, 
A section over here. But as you can see over here, it allows the control arms to move independently from each other. So because of that, there's no main uh, direct connection between them. But in addition to that, there will be few more components because uh, because the drive shaft is not actually moving with the uh, with the wheels. It actually have to have uh, moving or uh, joints over here and here in order to keep the power transmitting. Usually, these are CD joints or universal joints. In the old vehicles, they use universal joints, but now it has been replaced with the CD joints. And once you go to the independent suspension system, you actually have something like this. We have no connection between these two. Uh, both uh, both sides are separately attached to the uh, chassis itself. So uh, yeah, so assembling and disassembling is not a very big deal for these things. You can actually do a small practical once you come to the university. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, come to this session or this section of your class so with this uh, we are finishing up today's class and uh, um, running repairs have to be put or we have to discuss next uh, running repairs also we will not be going through very deeply because as you know i don't know whether you know uh, there's a separate module for a uh, uh, full diagnostic and rectification alone. The main idea of this module is to give the uh, necessary information and get necessary idea about the engines and all the components inside for learning uh, for the you for the sections or for the classes you will be learning later. So we will be discussing about the running repairs also very small a bit. So that's it for today and. Uh, uh, for the assignment for this section will be posted later. I think you still have some assignments to be submitted with the, So until I you do, I won't be some putting the assignment yet. So yeah, that's it. Um, uh, before I go ahead, uh, weren't you supposed to submit? Uh, you guys have to be divided into groups, right? You have a group assignment, right? Yes, sir. We have a group, but uh, didn't uh, divide into two groups. Why? What happened? Sir told us, uh, sir, we divided into groups. Now. You, your groups are already divided. Did you check your LMS? You have. I have already divided you. Wait, wait, let me check. Man, I can't remember. I actually divided you guys. Yes, you are divided or if you go to your uh, can't you guys see your group name? Yeah, so already you are divided into groups. So please check your LMS. You are divided into groups. And there will not be any change in your submission date. You have been divided into groups. Please check your LMS and make sure you do the group work and submit before the deadline. Yeah, since uh, we are in the LMS, since I am actually in the LMS, not me, I'm in the LMS. Let me. Yeah, just give me. A... 
So in uh, I think you all can see the LMS. If you go through the LMS, there's like uh, below like the last two slide. If you go to the last two topics, uh, there are two topics called uh, I recently had these things: course administration and reference material. So the first one in the course administration where uh, you can actually see if I posted any marks or anything, everything will be available here. Uh, let me do put the group list also here. So I will put the group list also here if anyone wants to see your group members in case you can't see. Uh, and in addition to this, uh, there's another one called reference material. This is where I actually add every reference material. As I told you earlier, the automotive engine servicing and theory this book oh now i have actually added there so you can go ahead and download it most of the things i discuss here and the rest uh, some things that we will be discuss in the future in other modules and automotive electronics drive train those are also included here so i uh, highly suggest you to go ahead and download that uh, in addition to that, uh, in the course administration, I just need to talk to you about one thing. So this is called the Automobile Students Attendance Portal, Attendance Portal, where uh, this is uh, still in beta version, but it's still uh, I'm actually collecting your attendance details through this. Don't send me any emails here after if you have any attendance uh, uh, related details. You can actually go ahead and fill this. So let me. Just go ahead and go into this. Once we go in, it will actually open the uh, file. Where are you? His mic is on. Uh, where you can actually see, where you can actually include your details. In uh, your ones, you can't actually see this response one because I'm the administrator, I can see it. So here you include your name, registration number the date you are unable to attend and the course code so you have to fill if you missed only one course you just have to fill uh, that module only so if you have four modules you can submit for four modules four forms has to be submitted for four modules so which activity you miss attending and uh, reason for not attending and in addition to that if you have any medical certificate or anything like this you can actually upload here once you do that i actually get all the responses through this way so i can actually see your name and uh, what happens everything why you did not actually attend the class in uh, here you can actually see one uh, attendance submission so medical examination so these details were actually uh, uploaded here so this way i don't actually have to keep track on you through the emails which is very hard because as you as i told you earlier there will be few more than few like around more than 20 emails are coming for us like we are receiving per day because we are also working from home so everything all the uh, um, discussion parts and everything actually uh done through um done through actually uh, online, right? Done through online. So emails are a very big part of that. So I really hope you do not use the emails. So if you have anything like this, any attendance issues, make sure you fill this. So it will be available for a few other modules also. So for automobile modules, you can actually use this without any issues. Okay, so with that, we are done for the day. I will stop from here. Uh, so we'll see next day. Right. Thank you. Hello, sir. Yes. Yeah. Uh, in uh, Moodle, uh, the, we can see there is a link. Uh, automobile student attendance portal like that. We can see. If but if we click it, there, there is a. Uh, Sorry, something print went wrong like that. Error message coming now in browser. Okay. Uh, then uh, there, there is another message. Please make sure you have permission to access this form. Only that. Okay, so I have to change the settings then. I will fix it. There's a setting that uh, I have to check. Uh, 
uh, you you don't have office 365 access right we have you have have you used office 365 before model 